You're very patient, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> you put up with a lot, guys. <laughs> <It> takes... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that executive session was on duty. Avaya. Okay. Please enter your collaboration code followed by the pound key. Are we boring you? Sorry, Chuck. You can leave. No. We get the The collaboration code entered is invalid. Please re-enter your collaboration code followed by the pound key. The conference is now starting. You are the first person to arrive. You will now be placed into the conference. Okay. It is now uh, 3.29. Uh, took us uh, about a minute to get back online. So um, we've uh, completed our executive session. And uh, so now I am uh, looking uh, for a motion to authorize and confirm uh, global settlement of Anna Lasco versus Spokane County at all, U.S. District Court, Eastern District of Washington, number 219-CV-00313-RMP. So moved. Okay. So moved. I know, I, I, I got it. Mary's on oh. mute. Uh, so, I saw her lips move. Second, sorry. All right. So, I got a motion and a silent second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Let, the aye. Motion, let the motion passes. You're good to go, Mr. Bartell. Thank you, commissioners. Have a great evening. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Then, uh, uh, 345 is supposed to be Mr. Coles. I'll call him real quick. Yeah, if we could get him online and then uh, then maybe we could uh, uh, have Maggie at 345. And uh, that will complete our agenda for this afternoon while she is uh, arranging for Mr. Chad Coles to join us. Uh, you know, either one of you have any miscellaneous matters you want to bring up? Mr. Gimmel? You know I have to. Uh, Ron has forwarded me a request from Jack Bridgewater, who is the, I believe it's the LA for Jenny Graham. And she wanted to follow up with the COVID response meeting. She, I think she was watching our meeting this morning now uh, that we had with the group. She wants to see if we can schedule a meeting with the commissioners to discuss the county COVID response, specifically how the local health district is collecting, cataloging, and tabulating the COVID data in Spokane County and reporting it to the Department of Health statewide. Please let me know if this is something the commissioners would be interested in, and I can schedule a conference call or other venue. So this is this isn't in our realm of authority. This is really a, a health board issue, not our issue. Uh, so my inclination would be to respond to her and say, please contact the health district board uh, for any kind of communication you might want to have with the board about the health department. But I'm not sure that this is our forum, unless you guys want to want to take it up. Well, I just, I would wonder, what is it she wants to share with us? I mean, do, does she have something from the, I mean, fr from the house, you know, fr from the state house? I mean, does she have information i mean i guess what what is it exactly she wants to share with us i wonder or discuss i i, I don't know i'm just wondering does she have information for us or i i don't know well a suggestion is that we call back uh mr bridgewater and ask specifically that question she's very specific okay. what she wants to talk about their data collection how do they catalog their, you know put them in categories and how they're sharing that, but what is it exactly she wants to discuss? Because as yeah. else, their method of doing or gathering their information really isn't in our bailiwick, it's in their yeah. bailiwick. Yeah, no, no, I you definitely make a point there. I'm just wondering, is it like 
is she going to share with us there's new ways that that has to be done? Is it she has concerns about the way it is collected? Is there a new method coming down the road? I mean, that, that that could be a variety of things she she wants to know. So yeah, so yeah, maybe if somebody could touch base and see exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. Right. Quickly. Yeah, I would say, you know, she needs to reach out to Amelia and talk to Amelia um, to find out, you know, the, the protocol there. You know, kind of like we asked him this morning or yesterday this morning, you know, about, you know, trying to get the data updated, you know, on the weekends and such. You know, it's, she's the one who really handles all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, we'll communicate with her to contact Amelia and coordinate whatever kind of interaction she wants through Amelia and the health board. Mr. Coles, thank you for joining us. Um, you are on mute. And uh, then we have Ms. Deborah Fortkins here. So is this a general update or is this executive session? Um, my understanding, I've got the, I'm trying to get a hold of Jessica to join us. Uh, and I haven't been able to raise her. Uh, she's set up for 345. She should be around. There she is. There she is. She just joined us. So is this executive session or is this just a general update? Ms. Pilgrim? I oh, I'm sorry. I just got a uh, noise on mine. What What was the question? The, the noise was me. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> we refer to that as Al. So. Yeah. <laughs> 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 really fuzzy around the edges and a lot of static. Um, no, is, this, is this an executive session item or just general update? Um, I think we'll start with a general update and, and if it morphs into more, we'll, we'll close her down at that point. All right, so who's leading out? Um, I, I think uh, we want Deborah to lead. Okay, our buyer has wants to um, use a clause that we have in our purchase and sell agreement, which is section eight of our purchase and sell agreement, which allows them to extend their closing for another 120 days if they submit $5,000, which is non refundable um, for that extension. But it goes against the purchase price, so it doesn't really do anything for them. But it's $5,000 that they have to put into the kitty that they will never get back. What's the Five purchase price? The purchase price? 2.5. 2.5 mil. Did they state a reason they'd like to do this? Well, at this point in time, they're trying to work out the access with um, DOT. I guess they're asking DOT for an extra um, lane in order to get the people into their place. They also want to have meetings with our, um, our um, design people, uh, development people, our development people on what they're planning to do and stuff. And so they don't think that they can finish doing what they want to do. Plus they're also getting their they're drilling the hillsides to check to see how, what kind of, if we compacted the soil when we went through and we were digging and stuff, or did we just throw the dirt on there? They're also looking for contaminants in the ground as well. So um, that's what they want to do in this 120 days. So it's, it's essentially due diligence. Deborah, would you do the follow on in terms of the gauge restriction? Please, so the board has a full idea of what we're asking today. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Would you, would you do the full follow on with the deed restriction and their, their comments on that so that the board gets the whole idea of what, what's, what they're asking right now? Um, on the deed restrictions, I haven't, I don't remember them asking anything about the deed restriction. They, they had a change they wanted to make? Yeah, yeah that, that was the last conversation we had, and then I think you were supposed to go back to them and then report back, and I don't think we ever heard back from you. Oh. Maybe, maybe Jessica is better positioned to talk on that. Yeah, I can, um, I can talk about that. Uh, so 
when we met with the board last time, and I'm trying to find my place on this, um, one of the issues that came up was that the buyer was arguing that they uh, that the there was a slope area that was not going to be developable basically, and that they wanted that slope area to be excluded from the percentage, um, the overall percentage of their mainly commercial development. And I, I recall the board uh, having a concern, what if later on the, the developer decides that they can in fact develop the slope area and they're gonna do it as residential and then it now they've basically just reduced their commercial development without, you know, having, you know, by, by accepting that. So I was charged with um, drafting language that in essence allowed kind of a, an ongoing adjustment. And so the language I drafted in essence said, hey, for now we'll go ahead and accept out that slope area, but, um, if in the future you decide that you're developing it, then you're gonna to have to adjust your percentages accordingly. And they accepted that language and then they came back and added their own language, which is conflicting, which is it says, for purposes of the foregoing restrictions, the parties agree that the property due to topography consists of such developable service area to not require more than seven acres of commercial development pursuant to the foregoing restrictions, which is the um, the different, the restrictions are the different percentage development. So that conflicts with our language. And the question is, that's working off of the original um, 40 acres, agreeing that 5.4 acres is undevelopable. And so 34.6 acres is what would be developable. So um, if they did, I think we decided if they did 20% commercial based on that, it was um, 6.92 is what Deborah, I think you came up with. Yeah. So the question is, does the board want to go with the more, um, you know, that's certainly more simple. And I think Chad had a valid point. We spoke this morning. Um, Chad, if you wanna talk about the uh, point you had on flat issues. So, so essentially, they they said, you know, we we don't want we want a fixed number, and and we prefer the lower fixed number. And in, in terms of how I would lay out a commercial development, I I wouldn't put any of the commercial. I put all that stuff right down by the roadways, and make it really easily accessible, and not up on the slopes. So, you know, to add it in later is is difficult for them. Uh, so, but it, it gets to what you guys are, what you guys are comfortable with. I, I, if I were them, I would want a fixed number to go in, because then I can do my master plan. Yeah. So thoughts, Josh, Mary. Um. So I mean. Ch Chad, what you just said, I mean, so, so you, you think, I mean, are, are you comfortable with that? Do you think that's appropriate? You said it's what you'd ask for too. I mean, do you think, are they asking for too much or do you think that's, that's doable? I mean, is that, is it reasonable what they're asking for? I mean, Al, well, you've, you've got a lot of experience developing land. I mean, are, are, is that, you know, are, are they asking for too much by doing that? I don't think they're asking too much. I mean, um, I, the the argument that they're the they can't develop on a slope. I mean, I don't know that they've ever been to Seattle or not. I find that, that argument to be a little weak. Uh, but you know, quite frankly, if if we can get uh, the even the seven acres of commercial development in there and stuff, I think we're doing good. So I, I'm not I'm not as as challenged by that. I'm challenged. Quite frankly, by the five thousand uh, dollar extension fee, I mean that's 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 less than uh, two two one hundredths of a percent of the purchase price. Typically, when you're looking for an extension, you're at least one percent of the purchase price as a non-refundable, and so that'd be a twenty-five thousand dollar, not a five thousand. You know, I don't. I'm more concerned about them working off of our time and our money than I am about whether they're going to develop. 
you know, seven acres or seven and a half acres kind of a deal. Uh, unfortunately, this was in our purchase and sell agreement, and one of the clauses that was in that purchase and sell agreement that they could accept. So I don't know how much you could. Oh, is there that. already in the purchase sale agreement oh, yeah. the right for an extension of five thousand? Oh, yes, it's written right in our got... purchase and sell agreement. We haven't updated our purchase and sell agreement in some years, so it's... yeah, we need to update. We might that. want to update that. I think we do. Yeah. It, it should be at least one percent of the purchase price for any kind of extension. So, but if that's in the if that's in the PSA, then we're stuck. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts. Extension and the purchase and sell agreement is it is it for 180 days? It's 120 days in our purchase and sell agreement, and that's what they're asking for. Okay, you're asking for 120. I thought you said 180 days. No, 120. I have the addendum that they no. sent. Okay. So. Okay. You're looking for a head shake from us. Um, it, we actually will need a motion. So the motion would be a motion to approve the modification of the closing date addendum. Okay, uh, so moved. I'll second that. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, I, what, I, I, do have, I do have the question. Go ahead, Josh. Um, Jessica, in regards to your conflicting language you pointed out, has that been taken care of? How are we going to take care of that? How's Correct. That it sounds, cleared up? Yeah, it sounds like the board's okay with going forward with the more simplified language of the seven acres. So I'll just strike my language and we'll just go with the set of um, seven acres that we basically that we agree that that's what it is for the commercial okay. development. All right. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. All right. Anything else? Nope, we're good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So if we could get Maggie on the line, we can finish up the CARES Act and Yeah, I told her about five minutes ago to get on ten minutes off email. Her. I have a I need it signed by and I know the chair of the board can sign to facilitate the Last time you lost your car doing this. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You're having a hell of a time selling this property, aren't you? I'm having a heck of a time. Good Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought there's there's no place here to sign it, just an initial. Initial do. I gave you an initial. <laughs> you want to know which one? <laughs> Perfect. I just emailed her and she should get on. Um, okay. Thank you. There's a there's a health board meeting scheduled for July the thirtieth. Did any or all of the board members planning on going to that? I got one no. No, I'm gonna be in Olympia. Josh and Mary, were you planning on going to that one? Yeah, yes. I'll be on it. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? <laughs> that was the best Al French impersonation <laughs> I've heard. That was, that was right okay, well, I'm just watching Gina. To, if two of you go, I just want Gina to make sure she posts that on the calendar. So. Okay. Thank you. Welcome back, Maggie. Thank nice you. Thanks nice for. You I'm glad to be welcome back. <laughs> oh, always, always. So the floor is yours, and there's nobody on the back side of you to pressure you. Okay, wonderful. I appreciate being able to come back and sort of follow up on the CARES request. Uh, I'm not sure if we can pull back up the PowerPoint, but um, or if you have it in front of you, either way. Uh, during our conversation last week. Uh, Thank you, Jared. Uh, we, I had shared a request for um, the supported for funding for supported release, also known as supervised release. I uh, understand and appreciate why the board felt that the CARES dollars weren't sort of the right uh, investment for this project given the time time limitations. But I wanted to follow up based on your direction with a couple of other requests 
related to uh, programmatic investments. So this slide is from the original slide that, uh, or presentation that I shared, sort of combining all of the requests from various departments. And so we went through this already, but today we're just gonna focus on the programmatic investments. So Jared, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and the areas for programmatic investments are these four that we'll take one by one, remote core access sites, criminal justice information hotline, transportation, and temporary housing. Uh, so to get started, we can go to the next slide. And this was something that uh, we broached during our last conversation. And I just wanted to provide, again, at your request, a more detailed uh, budget proposal. And to remind you, the idea is to provide areas based in the community where individuals can appear for court remotely. So as you likely know, some of the courts uh, are using platforms like Zoom or others to hold remote court hearings. And some of us um, are more familiar with that technology than others. Some don't have access to that technology. And so the idea here is to create some sites at shelters and other areas where individuals can go easily uh, accessible in order to appear for court or talk to their attorney before court um, and in between court. So what you have here is just sort of the breakdown uh, of the costs related to this program. I've had conversations with the different agencies you see here. Catholic Charities at their Haven residences are very interested, as is the House of Charity, Hope House, and then Pioneer Human Services has identified four different sites where they think this would be really valuable. Uh, and they have pulled some numbers that I, I don't have with me but can circulate after this about the percentage of their populations that are also court involved, and they're all pretty significant numbers. Uh, so they really see a need for this and we're very excited uh, to hear about the opportunity. Some had called in earlier during the, the board meeting uh, to sort of express support, uh, but clearly went, went over. So I'm not sure if they were able to join us now. Uh, but again, strong support from the community. District court is also uh, very supportive of this as is municipal court. I had a preliminary conversation with superior court about this with their presiding judge and uh, He's open to sort of continuing planning around this, but they're not doing remote court hearings for the criminal cases yet. So we're really prioritizing those lower courts at this point. Um, and so here's just the breakdown. We don't anticipate a whole bunch of costs, just a tablet with uh, wireless capabilities or wireless boosts, and then some limited staffing support. They're all anticipating a part-time need for staff to help get folks into the booth, get them logged on and set up before their court hearing uh, occurs. So in total, this would cost about uh, $78,500. And is a request, Maggie, for the CARES dollars? Correct. This is for CARES dollars, again, to um, ensure that folks are uh, being able to attend court remotely to sort of limit or, I guess, facilitate social distancing in the courthouse. Uh, while also addressing the concerns around court backlogs and increased FTAs during the pandemic or as a result of the pandemic. Can you go through the, the staffing support again? Yes, these are the uh, estimates provided by the various uh, shelters or different organizations. And they are so uh, lightly staffed at this point that they don't have a person who can uh, get someone logged on to the tablet or computer and make sure that they are ready to appear for court. And they thought to make this really run uh, smoothly and to identify which clients of theirs or residents need to be appearing before court and then getting them uh, again situated on the platform that they would need a part-time person uh, to do that. Uh, Catholic Charities would split a person between sort of the Haven residences and then the House of Charity uh, and then Pioneer Human Services would use a part-time person across their four sites. Uh, and then you can see the Hope House estimate there as well. Okay, hey, so the- Go ahead, Josh. Uh, so I was just, so Hope House wouldn't necessarily be getting the person logged on. Would that be for transportation of somebody to one of those other locations? Hope Since House they don't also, have any equipment? They or? did not need an equipment. They had an extra computer, so they didn't oh. need a tablet. That's why there's zero dollars in those categories. Okay. Okay, uh, Jim. Thanks, Commissioner. Maggie, uh, regarding the use of the sites, uh, not addressing municipal, uh, 
I understand if I heard from Larry that there is some court rule that allows this for district court, but he said there's no such rule or statute for superior court. That could be why Judge Clark, I presume you mean, was kind of holding back on it. Are you aware of any authority for superior court? I guess there is for district and I assume Justin or someone's told you for municipal, but have you are you aware of any authority to do that for superior court? I'm just saying I know your proposal's not for that today, and Judge Clark hasn't approved that today, but I'm, I guess I'm saying, is there ever going to be a case without some change in court rule statewide or statute that allows that? You'd I don't know of any that allows it or disallows it, uh, but again, would sort of defer to superior court and then working with the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office to determine whether it makes sense to develop that for superior court moving forward. Okay. And are these just for first appearance? Uh, we're actually working with the courts this week to develop a schedule of which hearings they think this would be proper or appropriate for. And so we're coming up with sort of a scheduling matrix of which hearings and which days so that we can uh, have a better understanding of the volume, uh, both for the court's benefit and for the, the different shelters. Okay. Yes, John. Just a quick question, Maggie. Uh, a CARES rule, unbudgeted. So with that, any of these, these are all unbudgeted? by any of these organizations? Correct. Okay. This is a brand new idea and project. And then the staffing support is also sort of estimated just on the months preceding or from August through December. Thank you. Anticipating. Yep. So, so Maggie, I, so to me, this is a great idea, you know, something I think we, we talked about um, just because this is a population that, you know, potentially can carry the virus. Um, and so having them not in the courthouse and having them have the opportunity there, and they're also the, the population that has less access to travel to get to the courthouse and, and so, so um, I'm hopeful that this is kind of a win-win on a lot of different, you know, areas. Absolutely. Okay, any more discussion on this one? Any more information you need? Hey, chair's open to motion. Okay. Do we want to do all of them and, and then determine which ones were on the list? It doesn't matter to me either way. I, I would say the more that we can total things up, the better. Okay. Can sure. you on then. Thank you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see the next request, and that is to continue funding the criminal justice information hotline. This is something that uh, hopefully you're familiar with. Um, we, we've talked about it before, I, I think. Uh, but it is a centralized point of contact for individuals in the community to call and get information about upcoming court dates, who their public defender is, where they're supposed to go and when, uh, and how they can get in touch with, with relevant um, parties or um, different departments. The call volume was initially fairly low. Uh, however, this week we've started actually making affirmative calls out of the hotline to individuals who are on a docket this week. So we're making phone calls four days and one day before court to people uh, who have hearings in district court. We're hoping to expand this to municipal court as well. And uh, we've reached out to superior court. And so we'll determine whether, again, it makes sense to include superior court in this. But right now we are making the calls to district court uh, defendants. And so again, here's the, here's the breakdown of the costs. Uh, the uh, most significant cost is the hotline staff. We have them working about 30 hours a week at $13.50 an hour. The centralized phone line is fairly small, um, as well as the one talk accounts. We do have a budget line item for a language line in case someone calls in and doesn't uh, speak English as their first language. Uh, and so that totals about $30,000. Meg, is this through December 30th of this year, the, the proposal? Yes. Okay. Is this been funded in the past, Maggie? And if so, that was mine. does that meet the criteria for CARE funds? Thank you. Uh, it was funded for, uh, through the grant uh, temporarily in response to COVID-19, so I'm not sure if that would be prohibitive, but it was not previously budgeted for in, in our budget or our grant. We reallocated funds at the beginning of the summer uh, to offer this service. Again, in, in response to COVID-19 and the increased confusion around court dates and court operations. 
So the one thing that I'm, I'm having trouble with, and you can help me, is the correlation between this and COVID is what? Uh, again, it's in part to mitigate the, the concern around increased failures to appear. Uh, the concern is that because court dates were canceled or rescheduled in response to uh, sort of shut down operations or limited operations by the court during this period, that folks are confused or they're concerned about coming to court. And so this hotline will be able to let them know when their court date's rescheduled to again alleviate the burden of resources that could potentially be placed on our court system and the jail if folks fail to appear and then are picked up on a warrant. Uh, this hotline could also alert folks to the opportunity of appearing in those remote uh, access points that I previously uh, shared. And Meg, it prevents them from having to come to the courthouse to keep the social distancing? Uh, potentially, this, uh, this would tell them when their court date is. It could tell them about the opportunity for remote court hearings, but in some cases, individuals will have to come to court. However, if, again, just as a reminder, if I had a court date in, uh, on Friday and I didn't show up, um, currently the judges are trying not to issue bench warrants, but that could change. And so if uh, a bench warrant was issued, I could be arrested simply because I failed to appear and incarcerated, which again drives up the jail numbers and is uh, a, a public health concern sort of as the numbers increase and uh, the facility's ability to allow for social distancing. Yeah, I see it more as uh, trying to prevent the FTAs that then uh, can uh, crowd the jail. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ma Maggie, how, how is this um, hotline being marketed? For, for those that need to utilize this number, how do they know what number to call? Uh, we have posted it on the county's website, our Facebook page, and then we also have uh, done some targeted outreach with different community-based organizations. And we recently just developed some small business cards that have the hotline's number on them, and, and then on the other side, what services um, the hotline can offer so that those are stationed in courtrooms now and some other departments at the county for people to pick up. Do you have any material that it's some of the shelter facilities? The Poster, posters, something that says, don't miss your court date, do call this number. We've circulated flyers. I'm not sure if they've made their way to the shelter, so I'll follow up with that, Jerry. And then also, I think uh, providing the business cards to those sites as well would be really beneficial. Thank you. Anything else you need from Maggie on this one? Okay. Would Would it be prudent for us to run this one by Carrie Griddle? Yeah. All yeah. of them have to go yeah. through Carrie. Yeah, they'll all, yeah. They'll all get the sniffing. No, no, no. Oh. Oh, but, but I, I thought Maggie, Maggie was hoping for us to make a motion to actually approve these today. Well, I, I would recommend that you condition it on that it <laughs> right. passes through Carrie's scrutiny. Right. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. We can make a condition approval. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Next item. Wonderful. Thank you. The next two items are some uh, proposals copied from programs and um, investments in Harris County, Texas, which is where Houston sits. Uh, they, right after the pandemic, set aside funding. Uh, it was not CARES dollars, I believe it was grant funding, to uh, basically, through a purchase order, pay for an individual's ride from the jail to a shelter or their residence in order to make sure folks were getting home safely uh, and sort of minimizing contact along their route home as well. Um, this is of significance for us because we know that about a quarter of our releases happen overnight and so transportation is limited and uh, it can be difficult for folks to get to a place where they can continue to social distance as a result. So um, this is important in, in consideration or in combination with the next uh, slide as well but before we get there the estimate here is that we would serve about 700 Individuals, I just estimated 50% of releases during the August through December period uh, for a total cost of $14,000. And Maggie, your estimate of $20 a ride, is that like a taxi That's from a, a taxi ride. It's just uh, a wag at this point. Um, it's what 
I think Houston's were, was a little bit higher. It's a much bigger county, um, but that's just the, the estimate that we have here. And then would we contract with the taxi company or in case uh, you just send them $20 and let them get a ride? The way it was done in Harris County was that there was a purchase order with the cab company and the cab, the jail basically would allow folks to call, contact the cab company if they needed a ride. And there was a, basically a voucher system so that the cab company would send the voucher to us or to the county and be reimbursed that way. Thank you for your social distancing with us. Okay. And Maggie, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a risk manager, but we bear no liability, right? If something would happen. We could run this by the by risk management and Steve Bartell, but again, uh, taking this from Harris County, they didn't have uh, any liability concerns. Okay. Maggie, I, I understood that Sparber was working on some things for bus pass, which would be cheaper. Have you coordinated any of this with him or checked with uh, Carrie on any of it? I haven't discussed this with Sparber recently. Uh, and again, the bus path, the bus routes are limited overnight. So this is uh, sort of at least an additional uh, resource for folks who are released after uh, a certain hour. Well, and it would enable social distancing on a bus. You might not enable that. So I guess that's part of the COVID rationale, Maggie, for this CARES Act. Correct. Okay. Okay. And in addition to investing in transportation, Harris County also invested in housing for individuals specifically leaving the jail. I know the board has already done a lot of work and set aside money just very recently in housing, uh, which I think is wonderful, but I wanted to also share on the next slide uh, sort of what Harris County did and why it was important. So an estimated 30% of individuals who are leaving jail are um, report as homeless. So that's likely an underestimate, uh, but they report as either staying at a shelter or transient. Um, so you can see the, the estimated number of releases between August and December. And Harris County basically connected folks with a ride from jail releasing to a hotel that they also worked with through a purchasing order and paid for them to stay there up to two weeks, again, in case they needed to quarantine um, and also prepare for or plan for uh, more stable, longer term housing. Uh, and again, allowing for folks who are in the jail to maintain social distancing once they're released. In addition to, um, to providing the housing, they contracted with the nonprofit to serve as case managers for this particular population to ensure they were staying safe and they were accessing whatever resources they needed to stabilize. Uh, so I've included the $10,000 here, but we also already work with Better Health Together in, for, with a reentry grant that's pretty well set up to offer support to this population um, if we moved forward with funding for this project. Uh, so again, based on the estimates we have here, it would cost about $421,000 or $411,000 without the case management. What's the COVID justification on this? The COVID justification is to get folks who would otherwise be potentially homeless and um, not practicing social distancing protocol as a result of that into housing uh, during, during a period in the transition from jail and then getting them set up with more stable housing. So is the $70 a night, they, they put them up in a hotel, motel, is that, they didn't Correct. like, okay. So why wouldn't we locate these folks with the group that is um, uh, in the convention, uh, in the arena, uh, or to be relocated up onto Mission Street? Isn't that the same kind of housing and same kind of climate, or am I missing something? Yeah, C Commissioner French, I was just thinking the same thing. I mean, the, we just allocated $2 million yesterday um, to provide for social distancing for this exact population that that uh, that Maggie is describing. I don't have any sort of concerns over that. I sh included it here before I knew about funding for the new shelter um, because I knew that the arena was sort of time limited. 
And I also think this is a population of folks who are unhoused who sometimes slip through the cracks because we're not um, identifying them before they're released and then connecting them before they're back on the streets without stable uh, or temporary housing. So if there's a way of making sure we can account for them with the recent funding approval that the board made, I think that's great. Uh, and I would just encourage all of us to come up with some ways to make sure we are uh, catching these folks before they leave the jail and connecting them to necessary services and housing. Okay. So the next slide uh, just sort of provides that total that you all were interested in earlier. So you can see a breakdown of each of the projects, those estimates, and then the total um, that's right about $545,000. Okay, any conversation, discussion, Max or, or Mary or uh, Josh? Um, can you run it back to the um, criminal justice information hotline one? Do we, so the IT support um, is over $100 an hour, our going rate? Yes, I believe so. I can go back and pull it, um, oh. but it's it, the departments are billed pretty heavily for IT use. I don't anticipate a whole lot of IT needs, uh, but did want to build it in in case there are any uh, sort of technological difficulties as we continue okay. the operations. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 you know, I, I don't, I don't doubt to, I don't doubt that that's the number they gave you. That's that's just kind of surprising that that we charge our departments over a hundred dollars an hour, but. Hmm. So, uh, so go back to the summary uh, page, the last page. So uh, which, if not all of these items, do you want to consider, if any? Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in the top three. I'm, I'm having trouble on the housing one, um, you know, and, and with the other, the top three, even, I'm, I'm concerned about the long-term sustainability. I mean, I can see the COVID need at this point in time, but it's, you know, it's, I'm, it's going to be sad to see it stop on December 31st, um, you know, because I think these are things that need to continue to happen, but we don't have funding to have them continue to happen. So, I mean, I, I think I'd want to, if we do these, you know, really want to see what the data is. You know, so Maggie, I'm hoping that we can track uh, what the data is to see if this is really helping um, and what it's doing uh, to know going forward. Uh, on the housing side, I mean, I think that's part of what we need to know with, you know, through the city of Spokane, they're trying to kind of keep track of how many beds are available in the different locations. Um, and so, so it'd be as, you know, maybe connecting the jail into that um, so that way people can find out where, you know, beds are available so they, they have somewhere to go. Um, I just feel like if we start to get into, you know, additional, I mean, we're doing the isolation center, which, you know, is a hotel. Um, and a lot of that is primarily for, um, you know, people that are not, you know, don't have safe housing um, that need to isolate. Um, you know, so, so if they're concerned about COVID, I mean, that'd be something that they could sort of talk to the health district and go to the isolation center if they need to be somewhere for 14 days because they're concerned about um, coming out of jail and being, being in contact with somebody. Um, so I just feel like I don't want to get into managing that. I'd rather let the health district manage that or having to go to a shelter that, that will be able to provide services for them uh, versus, you know, if they just got a hotel for 14 days, you know, there's not that wraparound services, I think. So that, those are just my comments on. Okay. Josh? Um, on the criminal justice information hotline, you said it would start out, um, uh, to, to begin, it would be targeted towards district court with the hopes of expanding to municipal court. Was that correct? Currently, it serves as a uh, resource for anyone in the public who has questions about their court dates or other relevant issues. So anyone, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, can call in. Currently, we're only affirmatively calling out to individuals facing charges in district court. Oh, okay. Calling out to district. Okay. Okay. I, I, okay. All right. Um, if, if that does expand 
to, to cover municipal court? Um, is the expectation that the city would help cover some of the charges for, to, to cover the, the time that would be spent for municipal court? Or, or would that just, would we uh, bear the burden on that as well? I haven't broached it with the city, but would uh, sort of take the direction of the board in terms of the next steps for any funding uh, planning, if there's any okay. alterations that we need to make. Okay, what well, would be the pleasure of the board? Well, do, do you have any concerns with any of these, Commissioner French? And I, I, I'm, and I'll throw in, I, I agree with Commissioner Cuny's um, assessment. I, I, I could support the top three if, um, if Carrie Gridall deems those to be acceptable expenditures. Yeah, that's where I'm at too. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve and authorize um, the expenditure of CARES dollars contingent on Carrie Gridall's analysis that these are uh, that, that these qualify for CARES dollars for the uh, remote court access criminal justice information hotline and uh, transportation program as presented by Maggie Yates on her um, programmatic requests. I'll second that. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All righty, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Uh, Gina has some information with regard to a uh, matter from Corey uh, Jodro at uh, TPA about some uh, actions that were taken earlier. Uh, what happened, commissioners, uh, she's putting some stuff up on there. Maureen and Jack started, and Maureen and I. Completed uh, three different agreements, which Maureen verbally approved to me before she left on vacation. Got back and advised Gina today at 2:06 p.m. That's why we're coming at this hour. One of the three documents that she puts on there, the last one that involves several of what I'll call their sub agencies. Commissioners, you're probably having dealt with TPA more than I have. You're probably more familiar with those specific programs than I am. But essentially, that document, the court, has, or excuse me, the board has already approved. The first two, uh, Jack and I did not bring to the board yet because we thought, and correctly so, there were some changes. The third one, I brought to the board thinking it was complete, and there was a minor change Maureen uh, put forward, so Gina did not record that document yet uh, since we, Maureen and it was discovered before the recording. It was one of those quick things. So uh, you'll probably have some questions when they come up, but uh, we think that process, which uh, started with Maureen, I think about two months ago, maybe more, has been completed. And that's what she's uh, putting up right now. Most of the documents look longer than they are because two of the three have lengthy attachments with material from Maureen about uh, their programs. Uh, probably uh, you're familiar with. So I'm not sure what documents am I missing? So how, how, how do we make this right, Jim? What do, what do we need to do? What I think you would need is a motion to approve documents one and two, and then the third doc, which are the two with attachments in the doc, the third one, uh, does not have attachments. That has already been approved, so you could approve that as amended, essentially, since there are some changes uh, between what was uh, technically approved about uh, three or four weeks ago. So, for the benefit, uh, could you state the motion for us that Thanks. you're looking for? Uh, yeah, and I and I th I think I mean I I get what I get what uh, what Jim is is going at the um, the. TPA board has continued to, to reduce these amounts, I think, based on the lack of revenue that's coming in from tourism. So they've had to adjust these, uh, original, uh, these original grant amounts um, or else it may be that they're holding the, they're not going to deliver these funds because these events have now been canceled. So I, I assume that's, that, that's probably the, the, that's, 
what the reason is for the change. Th these events aren't happening or else right. just the funds available have reduced because of the lack of, uh, of tourism. Exactly, so. and I think uh, Mr. Driscoll told me that uh, Ms. Drodro had made a presentation that was indicating some of what Commissioner Kearns has just said, and that kind of delayed things. Jack got different figures from Maureen as the thing went on, turned it over to me in the process of him, his leaving, and then uh, when we attempted to correct it, Gina and I wanted to make sure that this was fine with Maureen, and she responded by email to uh, Gina at 2.06 this afternoon that they're fine. So uh, Gina and I did not know she had technically approved that uh, material until a couple of hours ago, so that's why we're bringing it on now. As I say, the third one, uh, so I'll state some motions if that's helpful to the board. I think it would be. With regard to documents one and two, which were not previously approved, uh, motion would be to approve those documents uh, which involve uh, money set forth as set in those documents by the uh, TPA. Uh, so moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And the motion is to the third one is that uh, the one that uh, contains all of the agencies involved that are receiving money from TPA, that one, the motion would be to approve as amended as because it, because it was previously approved. So moved. Second. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, let's make a record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Anything else? Uh, Kathleen Torella, you're on. You've got information you want to share with the board? You're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, give you a quick update because of uh, some timing issues that recent, that I recently become aware of. Um, this is in um, associated with Department of Commerce's eviction rent assistance program uh, that the application is due July 29th, 2020. Unfortunately, they haven't released the application yet. Um, and so nothing is final. They're in a comment period until Thursday. And yet they want everything submitted to them by the 29th. And I recently just became aware that, you know, the, com the commissioners will be out for a couple of weeks. So I did request, or I had Tim request to the Department of Commerce a three week extension so that once we get the application, we can review it, complete it, get our questions an uh, answered and be able to get it before the commissioners in an update and an approval for us to submit the application. Unfortunately, though, if they do not give us that three week uh, uh, extension on that request, we will be required to submit that application by July 29th. And so what I was looking for in, in this update was to be able to get approval from the commissioners for the uh, CSHCD uh, department and the HCD division specifically to apply for the Department of Commerce's COVID-19 eviction rent assistance program application in the amount of $5,900,907 um, on July 29th in, in the commissioner's absence that uh, executive leadership could sign the application on their behalf um, or some other uh, option so that we could sign and submit the application by the July uh, 29th deadline. And this funding becomes available August 1st for rents due from March 1st, 2020 to December 30th, 2020. I can take your questions. So, what type of, oh, uh, sorry. So you what, go she ahead. Just, what she just stated sure sounded like a motion if somebody wanted to so move and then we can discuss. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll so moved. Second. Thank you. Discussion, Mr. Kearns. Uh, Kathleen, have, has there been any guidance or any information released on what what a renter, uh, what, what qualifications a renter has to meet in order to be able to access those funds? Um, there has been guidance that's provided, but it's in the comment period. So it's subject to change. 
but I did provide um, uh, Gina with handouts um, that have a program overview um, as well as uh, which has information on the uh, qualifications of clients and that sort of thing of course is going to be there's income you know required criteria um, but I hate to speak to it too, too much because it could it could change and we don't have the final information until Thursday on it but we know that there will be because there always is there's going to be limit uh, income limitations and that sort of thing does it look overly restrictive or does it look to be uh, does it look like it it would would cover a, a, a large population of our community if if they were behind on their rent I would apologize because I don't think I have the statistics on the incomes uh, levels okay. of what our population is but right now the threshold criteria which is in the BOCC memo if uh, when Gina gets that information to you, which I sent to her today, um, it currently says 50% of the AMA, of the, I'm sorry, the AMI, so the median income populate of uh, the population. So it's kind of in the middle. I know sometimes it's 80 and sometimes it's 30%. So it's kind of in the middle. Um, rent more than 30% of current income evidence that rent is not sustainable. Um, it also requires at least one month of rent not paid since March 1st. And then they have an, a, a kind of an additional other criteria. So it's one of the following. They must also meet, at least as, a, as of the last time of this draft, that they have to have been previously homeless within the last five years, eviction history within the last five, uh, three years, or formal eviction filed by landlord with court, or housing disruption due to client race, gender identity, sexuality, or religion, or at risk of severe illness per CDC, which would be 65 or older, or any underlying conditions. And then uh, the other last item is a disability, including a physical, developmental, mental, or emotional impairment, including impairment caused by alcohol or drug abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, or brain injury. A person with HIV or AIDS is also considered disabled. So that's the criteria that they outlined. So, so the individual would have to, have to um, ha fit into one of those criteria, or there's just like extra consideration given um, to somebody. No, they have to be one of those as well. So A, one. B, C that you see there, A, B, C, and then one yes. of D. So okay, so they have to have to meet one A, B, them. and C and then one of D. Correct, at least okay. as, again, as of this writing. Now, if they got a lot of feedback, they may change this criteria, but that's what it sits at right now. Okay. Hmm. Kathleen, this has to be submitted by the 29th, the end of this month. That's what they're saying. That's what their, their documentation says. As I said, we requested yesterday a, an extension for three weeks and they have not they said they're looking into it. They have not responded to our request. Okay. And Kathleen, we're eligible for 5.9 million, correct? Correct. Okay. correct. What, what I find concerning about this is when you look at D, I mean, if somebody, if somebody meets A, B, and C, but this is their first run-in with housing instability, they wouldn't qualify. I mean, we, we, we see it. There's a lot of folks um, that this is the first time that they've ever gone to a food bank is during this, this crisis. And if, and if it's somebody who this is their first experience struggling with being able to make their rent, as, as I read this, if they're not disabled, they would not qualify for this, correct? Well, unless they're at risk of the, uh, uh, per the CDC, that's another option. But again, it's, age and underlying conditions but and what we don't know is is it them or is it a family member so but you know again this is supposed to be wrapped around kind of the COVID-19 uh, prevention of eviction okay hmm. so I think the one constant we have is that it's going to change um, yeah yeah we don't know what it's going to change to between mm -hmm. now and next week but we're either in or we're out today oh yeah no, I, I, I support us doing it. I mean, anything we can do to help out, you know, fo folks in our community, I think we, we need to do it. I just, I, I hope it comes back a um, li little more flexible the, than it is that, than this draft is written. 
Okay. I'll be here. Um, there. So Kathy, who do we, who do you use to, who would we be using to get this money out to people? And I, that's the part I can't tell you for sure because I have, uh, Tim has, Tim Crowley has been out all this week and we haven't had his time to really sit down and discuss it. He's seen some of the documentation and he has some concerns and he's trying to figure out the plan. So he has a lot of questions with it too before we would decide that. But we would obviously like the um, CDG, CDBG CD plan is we would look, do we have anybody that we're already working with doing this? and then talk to them about capacity because it's a lot of it's a lot of money so it's a lot of people that then are behind that so that be able to have the staff to be able to manage this would be a big question so that's those are some of the things that we would have to evaluate and look at and i have not had the chance to do that so when tim returns on mon next monday we um, should have the final application from them and all the materials that have been updated and i uh, already have scheduled time with tim to talk to him about it first thing monday so we can sit down and figure out what would that plan look like? How would we meet that? Get all his questions answered um, from uh, DOC. We can also talk to them about flexibility as you've talked about. Um, it, you know, it, could it be a family member? Could they have been just impacted by COVID-19 or something like that? Is there more flexibility if the final product doesn't resemble that? We can ask those kinds of questions and see if we can uh, make it work better for us. And then once we have that plan, we can certainly, um, we would certainly provide an update to the Board of County Commissioners for this. And so if we get the delay, um, we would come back to the Board of County Commissioners with that information uh, before we submitted the application, if they'll give us an extension. But my concern is if they do not, I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss that opportunity. So either way, we can either do it post if we've already submitted it or come back uh, prior to submitting the application, if they give us an extension, and I can answer those kinds of questions. So no, I, I mean I don't want to miss out on the opportunity. I mean, so it's not that. I'm just. I think there was an article in the paper today, and I can't remember who the city of Spokane is using some of their dollar care dollars, and who they're using. I know the city of Spokane Valley is also using some of their care dollars for rent assistance and mortgage assistance. So I would I would just want to make sure that we're coordinating, um, so that way you know you know, we're all helping, you know, you know, ours is, is countywide, and so theirs can kind of supplement, and then we have our CDBG, you know, dollars already. So I just want to make sure that we're, it's a coordinated effort, and not just a single entity doing their own thing, um, and, and how we do that. The, the other concern I have is, you know, so this is for rent assistance, but, you know, where, where do we think we need to be for mortgage assistance? Um, you know, and so I've got to call into Catherine Morgan with U.S. Bank um, to kind of ask that because that's kind of the, the mortgage lenders are the ones that may know more what's what's happening there. I, I don't know. So that's that's the other piece that, you know, this is great for rent assistance um, and talking to, um, let's see, Joe Adder at Family Promise, you know, he's um, he's talking about that, you know, we're really going to see this more in September as the $600 a month goes away, a week goes away for unemployment. And as we look to getting past the, you know, extension on evictions, you know, so that, that that's when we're going to really see, you know, this need, you know, truly arise, um, which is his, his thought. So, so again, so I just want to make sure that we're, we're doing a good job coordinating um, and not, you know, having everyone in a silo and not really looking at it collectively to, you know, because if these are more restrictive and those their dollars are less restrictive, could you know, could we you know, work that way? So, absolutely, Commissioner Kay, that, that that's exactly how we um, would operate with this. We uh, worked with the city of Spokane and who they actually used for their um, rental uh, assistance is um, uh, Workforce Council, which we have a contract with and have worked with, and actually gave them a good recommendation. They were asking how. How did we feel about them? How was our um, relationship with them, which we said was very good. And so they actually continued to pursue forward with that for their um, uh, COVID-19 dollars. And so they may be somebody we can, we, uh, I would guess that we would definitely talk to, but I just, again, I don't know about the capacity. Um, so we have to kind of look at that. We would probably come back to the commissioners too, if in fact this would cover um, 
all of the rent assistance that we maybe had in mind when we were looking at the CDBGCB, our funding, and we said, well, maybe we'll take that funding instead, use it only for mortgage because there's demand there and we can't use that, you know, there's no other money for that right now. And because we have plenty here, you know, uh, not, I don't know if it's plenty, but quite a bit here with this 5.9 million. So that's the kind of stuff that absolutely we would look at and, and evaluate before we would um, be putting them out. And that's why we have to take a little bit of time too, because if you recall one of the big rules of the CDBG, and I'm sure this has got it too, but I haven't found it yet, but um, is at least with the CDBG CV was that supplanting you know, issue that if it's, you know, it's the dupli it's actually the duplication of benefits. We cannot do it if somebody else is doing it without funding. So we have to be really cautious and careful on, because we've been focusing on the CDBG funding and home funding that you approved today on the docket. That's our standard funding. We've been trying to get those through and those contracts through, and now we can really focus on the CDBG CD funding and how we're going to uh, put those out at the same time we're looking at this. So it's it's kind of good timing because they're kind of coming together so that we're making good choices and not creating issues doing something and then having to undo it because because of that duplication of benefit rule and things like that okay. and so the cdbg dollars that we got then um the almost because it's almost a half million dollars that we were putting to mortgage and rent assistance so then that can get potentially flip to just mortgage assistance. It could be if we, yeah, if that makes the most sense. I do know that I've heard from some of the other uh, counties in the state that they're struggling with uh, providing mortgage assistance because the uh, uh, banks don't want to take the funding from anybody but from the individual and that's not the way it apparently works. So um, and that's that that was even what the spokesman review uh, article that I forwarded you that was my response to, and not the article, but the question that came from the spokesman reporter is she wanted to know, does this funding go to the individual or go to the landlord? And to be honest, as I read through it, it's not exactly clear to me whether the funding would go to, which it would go to. It does have one line about landlords, but that's a question that if Tim doesn't already have the answer to, we've got to, we've got to understand that as well too. I'm assuming it would go to the landlord, but we would need to double check on that. And it's those kinds of rules if the landlord or the bank won't take the funding, then how do we? Yeah. No, when, you, oh. when I looked at it initially, it said landlord, um, that the funding would go to the landlord, but then that's where Carmen at the Regional Law and Justice Council was saying, but it's still under um, discussion, you know, that they're still taking comments and they're hoping to change comments. But I don't know. I mean, everything I've talked, people I've talked to and all that, it's it's always gone to the landlord or the institution. Yeah, and I think the landlord, I don't think we've been running into any issues with it going to the landlord. Um, and actually in this funding, I, what I thought was interesting too, though, is the stipulation that it says, if it holds in their final version, is as a condition of receiving the rent assistance payment, landlords agree that payment is considered as full satisfaction of the rent obligation and all late fees are canceled. So there's some pieces like that. So, but I haven't heard of any issues with the land, uh, with the rental assistance. It's only been with the mortgage assistance that some of the counties have been, been trying to put the money out and it got stopped because the, the bank or the mortgage holder would not take the funding from anybody but the individual who had the loan. So I'm sure they're working on a creative solution. By the time we get there, we'll we'll be asking them how they did it. But I do know that there are, there are a few hiccups along the way. Okay. Any more discussion on the motion? Ready to take a vote? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. All right. Anything else to come for the group? Anything at all? Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. Any miscellaneous items in the room? You're keeping it to yourself, aren't you? You got you're nothing. Bust, you're busting at the seams, wanting to bring got, something forward, and you're just. I got nothing. You got nothing. All right. Jer you're going to be with Jared. Alice for two weeks, and you don't have anything, Jerry? <laughs> where, where are you? What's that, Jerry? You're going where? <laughs> So do we, we have a special meeting on Monday? Yes, we do. I think we do. Okay. Nine o'clock in the morning. Nine thirty in the morning. Uh, okay, and it should just last a few minutes. 
it, 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 I'm going to try and make it as short as possible. We've got one item, and uh, so that's it. And this is on the uh, the uh, county code modification for the uh, department, the emergency management. Oh, this is on uh, changing the emergency management uh, responsibilities from us to the sheriff. Yeah. So, oh yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's the only that's the only agenda item. Five minutes at the most, and that includes four and a half minutes of nonsense. Yes. Do you guys not um, want to add miscellaneous? No. 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 If by chance the if by chance the grant application does not get extended and the board members aren't here and we have to sign it by the 29th. Yeah, I thought the motion included you signing it. I didn't hear that mm -hmm. part. I'm yeah, sorry. it included that. Yes. Yeah, try and keep up. I, I am. <laughs> I am. Boy, this is a tough crowd today. <laughs> tough crowd. <laughs> tough crowd. <laughs> Do you want to add miscellaneous items to Monday morning's meeting or just have the one item? One item. I got one, one, <laughs> one, <laughs> one very firm head shake say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just because you guys aren't do want to do the Facebook Live, and so Jared's asking me if I'll do it, and so I said I'd do it on Monday, but I just want to make sure Monday's very quick if I'm going to do, if I'm going to work one day, I'd rather just make it a day. Yeah, it's going to be quick from my standpoint. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say don't add it, but I mean, my, my only concern is if something happens between now and Monday that we need to talk about. I mean, that, that's, that, that's my only concern. Go ahead and include it, and we'll try and avoid it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sign it, so. Yeah, just, okay. yeah, okay. We'll do everything we can to not use it, but it's there as a backstop if, in case there's yeah, an emergency we gotta deal with. And, and make sure that you have my last no. It's off at 10, before yeah. 10. And yeah. I'll probably you have some, you know, I love miscellaneous items. I'll probably have something. <laughs> you just can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my utmost to make it very short. So, J uh, Jared, anything we need to know? Yeah, Kathleen covered the only thing that I was going to talk about, but also there'll be uh, Krem and KXOY will run stories on. Um, the two million dollars that went to the homeless shelters yesterday oh. tonight so they're okay. you know they're 24 hours behind the story but those stories will be on tonight and okay. nothing so, else that i can think of did so, did they interview you for that al no no oh. uh, so the, the, so there are two other uh, so one uh i don't know whether you've gotten any pushback on the two million that we gave for the for the shelter, but I've gotten about half a dozen phone calls going, what the heck were you guys thinking? And they're mainly from commercial property owners adjacent to uh, the site and stuff. So I'll be returning calls tonight and tomorrow to uh, address the issue. I think they're under the impression that this is going to be a homeless shelter. And I'm gonna stress that it's going to be a transition facility. It'll, it'll house homeless, for a period of time until we're out of this, but then ultimately it'll go to um, um, a uh, transition facility. And hopefully that will be less of a challenge for them. Um, we'll see. And then- um, Which was part of what I wanted to make sure we had that one year time frame in there. We need to make sure there was that caveat that this is- Right. And so, uh, and then, uh, I'll also reach out to uh, the mayor because they have said that they're going to be reaching out to the neighborhoods and uh, while the residential neighborhoods, the neighborhood councils have tentatively said, yeah, why not? Uh, I don't think they're reaching out to commercial businesses. So I will give a heads up to the mayor that she needs to reach out to the commercial business property owners and, and uh, make sure that they fully understand what's, what's happening there. Um, so, so that, and then um, do we want to talk about the gun thing or not? Uh, just give them a heads up. But. So uh, there is uh, one uh, news station 
that wants to do a story, uh, it's uh, being prompted by some of the local residents about the hearing examiner's decision on the uh, shooting range um, approval out in the West Plains. Of oh, the gun club? What's that? Yeah. The gun club? Yeah. That's moving it's, from the valley out there? Yeah. And okay. so um, the, um, um, they're, they're trying to do a package of interviews with the property owners, package of interviews. They want to get uh, one of us on camera and uh, talking about why we um, approved it. And I said, we didn't approve the gun range. What we approved was no shooting, or we approved the shooting range for shooting designation. And uh, then the hearing examiner was the one that approved the conditional use permit to allow for a shooting range and stuff. So that's a hearing examiner. The citizens that don't like that ruling can appeal it to Superior Court so it doesn't come back to us in this. Our only role was establishing the shooting uh, area uh, in the initial action we took, oh, geez, almost a year ago, I think, yeah. September of last year. So um, so just be aware that that issue is out there floating around too. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to speak to um, the, the role that the school had in uh, acquiring the previous, uh, I don't think that's germane to the story they're trying to run. So I'll try to keep the two of them separate issues and just talk about process and then uh, send uh, the majority of this over to Dave Huber as a hearing examiner and he can address whatever his ruling is. Okay. So that there, you're going to do an interview on that? Friday at three. On Friday at three o'clock. Okay. I do have a miscellaneous item. I knew if I talked long enough, he would. <laughs> 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 yeah. I had a, we have another request from Mr. Stone. And his, as I understand it, I talked to Roy. And his new proposal is that he would bid out the construction per county procedures. He would then ask the county to administer the construction project and he would write a check to the county. Uh, I, I don't believe that our engineering department has the bandwidth right now to take on that project. And my recommendation would be that we just let Mr. Snow know we don't we don't have the bandwidth to, to administer his construction project. We're run, we're running full throttle right now. We're having enough trouble getting our own projects done. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Gimmel? Early. <laughs> <laughs> give, me, give me some time. Only six more. <laughs> Uh, before he looks at any more papers, <laughs> Richard, thank you. Bill, um, Davida saying goodbye.